You don't oh. do it. Oh, they're whack. He's That's kind of underwear. interested now. I got him. Good. This Here's some other ones. These are not wet. They're dry. Touch the dry ones. Good. Touch the wet underwear. Oh. Yes, wet. Good. Let's watch some television. I guess to watch television for a while. Okay, he's staying with me, which is pretty good. Touch the wet ones. Touch the wet ones. Oh, they're wet. Touch the dry underwear. Good. You know, see me use a change in my inflection of voice, too, to kind of help contrast wet and dry. But this is how I'm going to introduce a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. just amazing. You have to Touch realize this is totally tissue. impromptu. I just saw it. He wasn't Ooh. getting it, so let me do it. Touch the dry tissue. What tissue? Dry tissue. Okay, good. Let's get the line. Pour some water. Make it wet. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there. Well, you it's wet. This is not wet. This is dry. Touch the dry. Big dry. Like some chips? Burritos? Like some burritos? Yes. Like some burritos? Yes. He's totally zoning in on the underwear. is wet. Touch the wet underwear. Good. This underwear is this underwear is not wet. It's tape on the dry. Touch the dry underwear. Touch the wet underwear. Yeah, it's got water on it. It's wet. Touch the wet underwear. Touch the wet underwear. Now you're seeing he's not giving me total total attention all the time. I'm getting it for seconds at a time. But when I've got him, he's actually making the discrimination. Okay, so I'm kind of competing against all these other things that are more attractive to him. So, you know, I could be a little harsher on this, but actually, I get him to, to learn the concept pretty darn quickly. Okay, he had been going for several weeks, if not months, on trying to learn this concept and haven't got it. So we got it pretty fast. What is this? What's call that? Tissue. What do you call this? Uh, tissue. tissue. What do you call this? Okay. He's got a 50% chance of being right anyhow just by responding to one and giving the other one. So we got to really get to discrimination. Yeah, that's where it's kind of funny. I'm not convinced he's got it yet. Are we Doritos? You want some Doritos? Good. Come on. 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 Come Okay, if I can get him and he's still got that going on, he'll still pay attention, fine. If not, I can shut it off, okay, and then I'll bring him back. I needed to do that. But in order to have a wet-dry discrimination, you've got to be able to feel something or see it in such a way that you can recognize that the material is <coughs> wet or dry. The feeling is what I'm trying to give it. Just touch it, okay, feel it, because that's, that's the most common characteristic. Which one's the wet ones? Which one's wet? Wet. What's this one? Yeah. Dry. dry. Touch the dry ones. Touch the dry. Dry. It's so abstract because you almost have to touch it to feel which one's yeah. wet. Very dry. Good. Which one's dry? Dry. This one's dry. What? That's dry. Here. Yeah. Dry. That's what some of the kids do. They just throw out whatever answer and they're going to be right 50% of the time. Dry. Dry. I want y'all to me. Good. Good. I want y'all to me. <laughs> then you gotta do something for me. Which one's wet? Wet dry. Wet. Say wet. Wet dry. Wet. Good. Give me the wet ones. Yes, good job. Water on this underwear. Oh, I'm making it wet. 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 Touch the wet underwear. Good. That's right. Good. Hey, feel this. Good. Feel this. Which one's wet? Wet. 
Wet. Touch the dry ones. Good, they're dry. Feel. They're dry. This one's wet. It's wet. This one's dry. Touch the dry one. Good. Give me the wet one. That's wet one. Oh, it's wet. Okay, let's watch. You got to get them attending to the critical stimuli. A lot of people don't get the kids to attend to the critical stimuli. You run them through. This one's Dry. Okay. Give me the wet one. Ooh, it's all wet. Ooh, it's all wet. Okay. Give me the wet one. Wet. Wet. Yes. Give me the dry underwear. Dry. 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 Good. Steady. She's still kind of guessing a little bit. Give me the wet one. We'll go on and on. But this is actually only about a half an hour teaching session, and he's pretty much at that point. One of the problems we have in our educational system is how we kind of talk about what we're going to do with the child. And that can lead us into some bad teaching practices. So for instance, let's say there's an objective on there that's going to say you're supposed to teach a child 10 new words, OK, to expressively label things like shoe and cup and so forth. So we write it that way. Well, now we pick the 10 words. And what do we know about the 10 words that we've already picked? Huh? They're functional words. OK, very good. And because they're going to be new words, kid doesn't know them, right? OK. So now, if I were to ask a child, and I know they don't know the answer to this because we know they don't know it, and I say, what is it? What am I going to put down as my first data spot? A minus, right? Save the ink. Don't bother. Why should you do it? You already know they don't know it. So don't, you don't have to write it down. You already, that's why you pick the words. But see, what happens is a lot of times people say they take the 10 words, they write on the data sheet, you know, shoe, cup, bowl, plate, spoon, and so forth. And then they'll go across all 10 of those items, and lo and behold, they'll go through 10 trials, and they'll put down 10 minuses. No surprise, because that's why they were picked. They don't know them. And then they go on, and they start to teach them again. So then they go through them again. Well, why would you do that? It'd be like saying, OK, I'm going to learn I'm going to learn 10 people's names. So you tell me your name, and 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 your name. Good. What's her name? I have not a clue. You gave me too many stuff all at once. How am I supposed to remember that? I can't do it, but yet we oftentimes expect children to do that when we go to teach them. So what I say is, rather than trying to teach 10 new words, that's your objective, is that they're going to learn the names for these 10 new items. But take one and teach it to them, just like I was doing with that little boy Daniel. We kept coming back to tape, tape, tape. We got on to other things, come back to tape. But you only work on a couple of them until they get them, and then you can add on the next one. So tomorrow you come in, it's day two, and you've worked on perhaps two different ones. You worked on tape and spoon. Good. Check. Do they remember tape and spoon? Those are meaningful data points. No, they didn't remember tape. Yes, they did remember spoon. Cool. Let's work on tape some more, and maybe we'll add on one other one to work on. But I don't need to check the other eight items because we know they don't know them, and we didn't teach it to them yet. So don't bother. Spend your time on the ones you're working. That's where you're going to collect the data. But sometimes our data collection procedures lead us to go through doing assessments about stuff that we already know. If I know you don't know it, there's no reason for me to ask you day after day after day the things you don't know. Save your time. Save the kids' time. Work on teaching them. Get some actual teaching trials in. Okay. The next topic I'd like to talk about very, very quickly with you, because I've got a number of topics I want to cover yet today. One of the topics is that of receptive by function feature or class. And this is a receptive language type of skill. It's receptive. The child is responding as a listener. We, we say something to him, and he will select something based on the functions of the item, features of the item, okay, or the class of an item. Class can be any number of groups of items. You know, functions are things you do with an item, features, common descriptions, characteristics such as parts or shapes of items. 
textures and so forth, any kind of attribute classes, any general category, so things you find in the kitchen, things made out of wood, things that you write with and so forth. So there's any number of classes you can come up with. Now, when you teach this, what you're doing is you're pairing a verbal stimulus with an array of nonverbal stimuli. So for instance, I'll be taking items that the child already knows. This is not to teach them new items or new concepts. It's to listen to what we're saying about things and select things based on our description of without saying the thing's name, okay? So we're going to take a student who has perhaps about 200 different items that he can expressively label and receptively discriminate, so he's got both of those skills. We're going to work with the child who knows how to receptively discriminate and expressively label several different actions because we're going to be talking about what things do, so they need to know action words. We also want to make sure that they've got a well-generalized set of repertoire regarding these items, that they're not worrying about this is a pen and they see something else that's like a pen and they, they can't tell the difference or they can't identify it as being a pen if it's a novel example. And we also want to be able to respond to a variety of different types of carrier phrases. Can you show me? Can you find the? Where's the? And so on, okay? If we've got a child that kind of has those criteria, what we can do is we take from the list of known receptive discriminations and packs, expressive labels for things, and we'll introduce two stimuli which are very different from each other. So he might say something like this, give me the one you drink from, or give me the one you write with. Okay, so we're getting the child, and the receptive response is all they've got to do. they just got to point to it. But because they already know these things, what frequently happens is if I say, touch the one you drink from, they'll often touch it and they'll say, cup. And so now what we're getting is, you drink from and cup are now going together. Those verbal, my verbal stimulus, drink from, and their verbal response, cup, are now starting to go together. So it actually is kind of laying some of the groundwork for what we call the introverbal later on. Touch one you write with. You know, touch the one you find uh, in the kitchen. Touch the one you find in a drawer, or desk drawer, or at school. Okay? So we can have all different ways of talking about these items. And that's what we do in life. We talk about the items that we know the names for. And so what we'll often do is we'll begin with two stimuli just like that. What we, what we wouldn't do is begin with like a spoon and an apple and say, touch the one you eat, touch the one you eat with. Those are too close together. Okay, so we might do, touch the one says meow. If I had a cat, pretend this is a cat, stick figure drawing with a cat. Okay, <laughs> so touch the one says meow versus touch the one you drink from. Okay, so we could keep them very, very separate at first. So by doing so, like I say, we're introducing these verbal stimuli. And what often happens is if we're very, very savvy, we can go to the interverbal with this procedure. It's not the only way of teaching the interverbal, but it's one way of getting there. That's why I wanted to show it to you quickly. If I said, touch the one you drink from, child reaches out, they know what it is because they know the name of this. They say, cup. And say, that's right, you drink from a cup. <coughs> you drink from a, and now you see I've taken it away, and now he says, cup. So we're now getting the verbal stimulus you drink from, cup. And we can also reverse it, touch the one you drink from, and you go, cup, that's right, you drink from a cup. You use the cup to, and then they say drink, so we can start reversing it, go the other way with it, okay? So we can start manipulating the verbal stimuli around, just as another format for us. But you notice there's a difference between, you know, the one you drink from, and let's say that you couldn't touch these, I could also do a, a tact or expressive label by feature function class. But name the one you drink from, and you go, cup. Name the one you write with, you know, pen, good. So I could do it also as a tact as opposed to receptive. So there's variations on this procedure. So I'm just trying to introduce verbal stimuli to you in a different way here, okay? I want you to be able to understand that we can use this procedure using their known skills to develop some other procedures, okay? And this is what happens in the transfer procedure here. You say the receptive by function feature or class procedure often evokes verbal responses in addition to the pointing response. I often name it. So it has the basic elements of an interverbal, and we gradually fade out the item, as I just showed you, and now we can introduce some distractor trials. So now I said, touch the one you drink from, and they touch it, and they go, cup. That's right, you drink from it, and they go, cup. Good, can you clap your hands? Can you touch your nose? Good. What do you drink from? You drink from a, and they might be able to say cup. So just like with the other skills I've been teaching you, you can start introducing distractor trials in there too. See, one of the things that we want for these children is to be able to, you know, at the end of the day, parents want their kids to tell them what their day was like, what they did, who they did it with, and where. 
Well, one of the problems we have with a lot of these kids is they hear these verbal stimuli, but they, don't, they haven't learned how to respond to it. And so now what we're doing is we're introducing it in a very easy response where they have a known response, a receptive response that they can engage in, and then we can transfer it over to the introvert. I'm going to show you a quick tape about this. This is one of our interns working with one of our kids. And what she's doing is receptive by function, feature, or class. This is the first time she's ever done it, OK? So she's doing very, very well with it. But let me show you how it can get more and more complex. I showed you the simple, but she gets to the very complex really quickly in a matter of minutes. I know she's got an array of three items out there. Touch the one that flies in the air. Isn't it? Yeah, an airplane. <gasps> and touch the one you wear on your feet. Chucks. Yeah, what do you want? Okay. Okay, so one you eat, one flies in the air, one that has wheels. What's nice about this procedure is you can then start changing the stimuli. What you don't want to do is keep using the same stimuli all over. You want to have multiple examples, okay? So rather than just having, you know, socks, you have shoes, you might also have slippers, you could have all kinds of stuff, boots that you could wear on your feet, things that fly in the air. It doesn't have to be an airplane, it could be a bird, it could be a kite, and so forth, a helicopter. There's all kinds of variations you can put into this so that they don't just learn a single response. One of the problems we get with a lot of kids when we start teaching them interverbal responses is they, they give you the answer that they've been taught. So you hear, what do you wear on your feet? And you go, shoes. So they hear feet, and every time they hear feet, they say shoes, because that's the word that's most commonly associated. We don't want that. This is a way of introducing a verbal stimulus, okay, so like wheels, and then having many different types of responses that could come from it. Because there's a lot of things that have wheels. So there's bikes, airplanes have wheels, okay, cars have wheels, strollers have wheels, a wheelbarrow has a wheel, there's all kinds of stuff, right? Some chairs even have wheels, right? Anyhow, here we go, second set. Touch the one that has wheels. Yeah. Car, great. Touch the one you wear on your feet. Yes. On your feet, you wear. See what you did? She pulls the cards away. Now he's going to go ahead and respond. And he doesn't have the stimuli to respond to. Okay, so this is the nonverbal stimulus. It's got the verbal stimulus on your, what do you wear on your feet. Now that was kind of unexpected, so you just did shoe, but that's perfect. That's what you want. You don't want a kid just giving you the same answer over and over again. Name some fruits. Apple, pear, banana. Name some fruits. Apple, pear, banana. I think I'm going to have a piece of fruit. Apple, pear, banana. I mean, that's what kids often do. They just hear one word and they give you the sequence that they've been taught to give, and you don't want that. And so this procedure actually is kind of creative in that what it does is it allows you to introduce a wide variety of stimuli. This is something that a speech and language pathologist kind of grain ingrained in my head many years ago. Just saying, now it's great you can teach these kids to answer questions, but most of the time when typical kids are developing their language skills, they're developing it in the context with the stimuli that they're interacting with. And as a result, this procedure kind of got developed as a way of trying to keep the stimuli involved while we're developing their ability to talk about things in their absence. So it's a nice little procedure. Different responses. Oh, nice medicine. And we can also make the array even larger, such that there's more items to choose from. Okay. That's the one that has wheels. Bike. Foot. Bike. Okay. She so self-corrected. She's going to run a correction Which procedure. Which are the ones that have wheels? Yeah, give me five. Which one has wheels? Bus. Cart. Good. 
And that's perfect too. He didn't say bike, he said car. That wasn't even part of the array. That's wonderful. Okay, so you see that's part of the integral. So when you get a verbal stimulus, you should be able to come up with many different verbal responses which are appropriate for that verbal stimulus. So say, let's talk about hockey. And you say, well, uh, hockey sticks, pucks, nets, ice, so forth, okay? Same thing here. So he didn't just give the answer that he was just shown the options. He came up with some other ones, and that's exactly what we want him to do. So this is perfect, okay? Anyhow, that's a nice little procedure to get to the interverbal. In the book, Teaching Language to Children with Autism, there's some sheets in there that allow you to teach both receptive by feature function class and also <laughs> intraverbal. It introduces verbal stimuli, and it has verbal stimuli associated with it. So for instance, for a book, what do you, what do you often say about a book? Something you read them or tells a story. So you start taking a look at these ranking A, B, and C, and those are ranked from like probably the most common things you hear about the item to a little lesser uh, probability of hearing something related to it. So for instance, with book, so you read, so you read a book, read a book. Oh, so it's something to read, a book. We're hearing this over and over again. Also, it tells a story, okay? That's probably a little less likely, but it's also fairly common. It's a B. And then some of the attributes of the books, like it has pages, it has pictures, it has words, and something that's kind of related to it thematically, a magazine, those would be ranked a C. And what you do with this is you take a look at some of the other ones, like let's take bubbles. What do you hear about bubbles? So you pop the bubbles, you blow the bubbles. Those are both rated as an A because people say, oh, pop the bubbles, blow the bubbles, let's blow some bubbles, let's pop the bubbles. You hear that over and over again when you're playing with bubbles. And then you take other ones, like with bubbles, like, you know, it's a toy, have to use a wand as soapy. Well, those are, you don't talk about that very much when you talk about bubbles, generally. Might be buy at a toy store or something. But anyhow, so you start taking a look at the A's. And what I do is I'll go in and I'll start teaching some of those simple discriminations. You know, you blow them, bubbles, good. Something you eat, chips. Something you read, books, we'll start with the very simple, and then start working down the list of some of the other attributes as you're teaching those attributes to the child. It's not to teach the attributes, you teach the attributes, and then you get them to pay attention to items which have those attributes, okay, there's a distinction there. Okay, so anyhow, that's what you do. There's some verbal stimuli that give you plenty to work on for children who are developing their intraverbal uh, repertoires for quite a while, talking about all kinds of things, like for chips, for instance, you eat them as food, as something salty, is made from a potato. Who knows that anymore these days, right? Because you really don't see it, they're made from potatoes. Uh, anyhow, it's crispy, the attribute, something you have for snacks, snack, something that you dip, it comes in a bag, and so forth. So there's all different ways of stimuli that might be appropriate to talk about with potato chip. Okay, so I just introduced that to you very, very quickly because I want you to be aware of it. It's a useful, useful procedure for teaching a lot of other language skills besides receptive, getting children to just pay attention to the words we're using. I need a drink. Ooh, I'm going to pour it in the cup. Pour it in a cup. Okay, pour a drink in a cup. Okay, so we're starting again to pay attention to the other words that we're using as we're talking about them during daily activities. Intraverbals. Verbal stimulus, different verbal response. That's all it is, okay? It can be anything. I say potato and you say chip. <laughs> You could say potato, and you say Idaho. I mean, there's all different types of responses that might come from any particular verbal s statement that we make. But when we talk about topics, that's what we're, we're doing essentially, is we're coming up with related type of comments about things. Like I said, if we talk about hockey, that's gonna bring up certain mm -hmm. types of comments that we might be making about hockey, like the river rats, you know, here in New York, or your local team, in case you didn't know that. Okay, or if you're a Canadian, and you're up around Montreal, you yeah. know, who might you be talking about? Mm -hmm. The Canadians, that's right. So, again, you start talking about all the different players and what they do, and you can get extensive intraverbal repertoires about any topic. But with children, what we often do is we start out by teaching them to pay attention to words we're using and then being able to give other verbal responses. One of the ways in which is most effective for a lot of kids is with songs because a lot of kids really, really enjoy the songs. They're kind of fun, whether it be the Wiggles or whatever song that they happen to like at the moment. You can teach them to start filling in some of the words. Some of the songs, like you know, the Happy Birthday song, you know, Happy Birthday too, and they go you, and then you, go, you just fill in, you, they're, but they're paying attention to that flow of the verbal stimuli and when they have to respond verbally with a different verbal response. So we use this a lot to get kids not only interested in what we're doing, but also get them to pay attention to 
contributing those responses where they're supposed to go. So this is a videotape of a child here singing a song with the therapist, okay? And I want you to watch how the therapist kind of works very carefully with the child to develop these skills of the child. How okay. many? That's one type of intraverbal response. Here's another sequence I want you to watch. I'm going to be showing you a couple of what I call mixed verbal behavior type sessions because once you start getting into the intervals, you're talking about things. It's not just that you talk about things in their absence. Typically when we're developing our ability to talk about items, we've got some items around us. We may also be asking for some items. We may be mixing it all together. And that's where in the training of children, you don't want to just do 10 or 20 trials in a row. For instance, let's just say that I were to be going through a whole list of things. I say, what's this? And you tell me the name of what's this. Tell the name of, said, what's this? And you go, cup. And then I say, what color is it? What often happens with kids is they'll say, pen. Because they're no longer paying attention to the verbal stimulus. They just know you're naming things. They say, oh, no, it's black. And they go, black. OK. And then I go, and what color is this? White. And I'll say, what is this? And they'll say, silver, if they're really smart and know that color, OK? <laughs> and because they know it's probably going to be colored, they're not listening to the verbal stimuli anymore. That's why you have to mix up your trials with kids. You don't just go down the road, all one type of trial, then all down the next one. Where that came from, you have to remember, is historically, when people were setting up doing a lot of this discrete trial instruction, they had the data sheets, it was based on how do you get people who have, shall we say, some minimal training in terms of how to teach to be able to get these kids to learn a lot of skills. When you start looking at 40 hours a week and you're hiring people to come in and you've got to get them up to speed and train them and they're going to turn over fairly quickly on you, you want to set it up real easy. Okay, here's what you do, here's how you do it. They kept it simple. Well, in keeping it simple sometimes, they often taught the kids not to pay attention to the changes in the verbal stimuli because they asked the therapist not to do that. Okay? But at a higher level, you need to be paying attention to all these changes in the verbal stimuli that are coming at you. And so that's why what I like to do is when I train parents, when I train educators, I really try to teach them to start mixing things up right away. So it might be, well, can you do this? That's right. Can you say, ah, ah, good. And now how about this? Can you do this? And then they do it, good. What do you want? And then I might have a man trial where they're actually able to ask for music or tickle or whatever it is that they want but I'm mixing things up at a very early stage of the training. Then when we get into the language component of it, it's not just what is it, what is it, what is it, what is it, okay? Or touch the, touch the, touch the, touch the, or I give a verbal stimulus, you know, what do you smell with, what do you taste with, okay, what do you feel with, you know, not all the same type of, I'm gonna mix it all up, 
And so that's what you're going to be seeing now. The intraverbals you're going to be seeing and hearing are now going to be embedded into other types of training trials that are going on, okay? So let's watch this tape. Okay, get ready. This is in my clinic. Nice sitting in your chair. Very nice. Good job, buddy. What's wrong with your fingers? Yeah. Sticky. Sticky. Good, your hands are sticky. What should we do? Wash our hands. Okay, where do you wash your hands? On the breath. The bath. Okay, good. You wash your hands with soap, Ben? Yeah. Good job. What am I doing? Washing your hands. Now, that would be a logical assumption if you see somebody doing it when you're talking about washing hands and sticky, but she wants to teach him about rubbing because part of washing your hands involves rubbing your hands under the water. So she's going to make a point of teaching him that this is